I was just thinking Barry was at the last two Dublin games and they're so one sided now. I think an opportunity for Leinster Council is to install a wee playroom in Crow Park just to <laughs> occupy the kids while the game's on. And, you know. this, do we have to change this podcasting podcast to Emma M- M- McGee's parenting podcast? <laughs> Hi there, you're very welcome along to the G-Hour with me, Darren O'Sullivan. I'm delighted to be joined in studio with Barry Cahill and joining us remotely is Aim McGee. I feel like we've gone back to the 90s. Derry are Ulster champions and not in the Forrester in the Premiership. Barry, how's the farm? I'll go, Darren, yeah. Enjoyable weekend of sport, um, particularly Real Madrid's win. But um, <laughs> yeah, on the GA front as well, obviously with Dubs on, on Saturday. Uh, I was in Crow Park myself, so all good. All the Dubs are smiling these days, unfortunately. My old buddy Eamon, how's the crack? No smiles above in Donegal this, <laughs> this Monday morning. For, forcing a smile, forcing. And the, <laughs> the thing about it is, I can't even book a flight to get out of the country and get away from it all. <laughs> we're, we're stuck here. Go down to Dublin Airport there and join one of the queues. A bit, a bit of crack in it. Yeah, it'll just drive me over the edge altogether. <laughs> yeah, no, look, it was, a, it was a massive weekend of sport. Nearly too much of it going on between all the provincial finals, the Heineken Cup final, the Champions League final. The Taltian Cup. Uh, but we're going to start with you aiming above an Ulster. Um, I was tipping Donegal. I thought they'd have the experience and know how. But it's unbelievable by Derry if you can take off the Donegal hat and the Donegal colours, uh, what they've done to win an Ulster Championship, um, what Rory Gallagher has done, the belief he's put into that team and the route that they had to get there. It's some achievement by them. It's, it's an unbelievable achievement. You know, get over the disappointment and, you know, detached emotionally from from all that being a Donegal supporter it's an unbelievable achievement what Derry have done and what Roy Gallagher has done um, and, the, and the way that the Derry players have rode in behind him it's just uh, them to go out and beat Tyrone them to beat Monaghan comprehensively and then to just go toe-to-toe with Donegal in one of them kind of KG you know defensive affairs and the arm wrestle, that's what we like to call it. And, you know, beat Donegal and that, that's that's a serious Ulster champ. And that medal will mean something. You know, we'll probably chat about it later on, about the provincial mm. titles. And, you know, the, they're, they don't mean as much, but that one will mean a lot to the Derry, to the Derry players and to the, to the Derry public. And, you know, there's a lot of good work being done in Derry, Jay. You know, people like Mickey Donnelly and, you know, Chris Collins and these boys would have done a lot of good work underage. And, Brought a lot of good players through, and um, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. Yeah, and Barry, like Derry, it hadn't all been playing sale, and they've got Rory Gallagher, especially, he's got a lot of stick. Joe Bradley, especially at the start of the year, and criticising him and their style of play. But Rory Gallagher's kept his kept the country, said nothing, didn't hit back, and at the end of the day, I don't think anyone's complaining up there this morning. No, no, you're right. I mean, I think Joe Barley absolutely slayed at the appointment of, of Rory Gallagher when he, when he got the Derry job about three years ago. So, um, yeah, not like, it's not like Barley <laughs> to ever get anything wrong, is it? No, um, but look, full credit to, to Derry. It was probably the hardest Ulster Championship you could possibly win, you know, to beat three Division One teams uh, en route to it, to not play any home matches, to beat the All-Ireland Champions uh, away from home. And also... I think yesterday's performance was probably the most impressive for me of the three because, you know, the the surprise element had gone out at Derry at that stage. Mm-hmm. Everyone had watched them very closely, and particularly Donegal over the last few weeks, playing in a final. The expectation, I'm sure, within the county, there was a great buzz. And this was all completely new for the players like Eamon and, and yourself. You know, when you're playing your first provincial final, it's different, you know, than playing a quarter final or a semi final. There's an extra edge uh, to it, but to actually beat Donegal in that manner and that game um, and to edge it out, because at one point, after having the five point lead, you know, Donegal obviously started to edge in front midway through the second half. A lot of people probably would have felt that the experience of Donegal would just about see them through, but they came back, got the draw and then pushed on an extra time. And look, that will that'll be uh, that'll be a huge win for Derry and the players and the management and really just, I suppose, underpins everything that Rory has been doing over the last two to three years and you know they're going to bounce into Crow Park now in, in a month's time and it's probably good that they have that you know three or four weeks now where they can celebrate for a little yeah. while come back down to earth and then start preparing for the, the business end of the championship Yeah the, the actual break will probably suit them because you get a nice a week anyway to get your come down and then you start preparing and working on yourself and stuff but Eamon from a Donegal point of view another 
not a disappointing day where so many of us expected so much more. It was watching on TV. It was it was a poor game to watch standard wise. I know mm-hmm. someone will say it was. I think BBC were saying it was gripping and fascinating. RT were saying the opposite. For me, I'm kind of stuck in the middle. But it was poor for standard wise to watch. But like that because it was tight. You kind of tuned into it yeah and you know sitting beside two of the <clears throat> two of the club lads and we knew and it, most of the public knew that what type of game it was going to be um so we weren't too particularly annoyed about it you know it was we're sitting there and we kind of how are they going to work it out and how are how are donny gall going to work it out how are Derry going to work it out then it would be i would be in denial to say that you know it was a quality game and this and that and it's exciting because User, user, all and look at user from a neutral perspective, and mm. user saying it's a bad game. So we have to take that face value, and you know, if it's a bad, if user saying it's a bad game, then it's a bad game now. But I was just interested in terms of the way most of it. There wasn't particularly much counter attacking. You know, it was just one team is running back, setting up. The other team is doing the exact exact same. They were just mirroring each other, and we we're just trying to work it out. So was that phase? basically just the one phase of play the majority of the game of just trying to work out that blanket defense and you know for, for Donegal the execution just wasn't there yesterday in terms of how they were going forward working it out and even when they were setting up just Derry seemed to be able to get in for the shot and get the score far easier than what we were getting and it was just incredibly frustrating incredibly mm-hmm. frustrating and you know you will probably talk about it a wee bit more yourself and Barry but it's you are speaking it from you are not attached to the team i'm compromised i know lads that are involved friendly with them i brought a brother on the panel so i'm always going to side on the what the donegal one and because and get a positive because you are that close to a man would you would you ever feel geez would they just go out and play their own game like you, you mentioned it there they mirrored Derry, and going into it i always said i think donegal are a better team than Derry currently they are. They I, are a better, better, better team. Yeah. Why? Why do they mirror a team that aren't as good? Like it just it confuses me because I I I've a good time for a lot of the Donegal. I think they have yeah. super footballers. I'm there. You're actually taken away from how good Donegal could be by mirroring a team that aren't as good as you. It, that was my opinion going into it. And 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 that's the thing. You know, try and give my best taking it here is that yeah. we 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 are not balanced in terms of how we go at that. You know, obviously, you're not going to go gung ho and just silly stuff and yeah. get turned over. We're not balanced between that possession. There has to be a certain risk involved. You know, yeah. there there has to be a way you just throw off the shackles. Because, as you say, we have too many good players to play as conservatively. Like you know, we're in my opinion far better team than Derry, and to play within ourselves and look to contain Derry, it's just. Uh, that that that's my own take, and yeah. you know, even the way when we are trying to work out, as I say, that what I would call the slow detect, yeah, where you're just trying to over and back, and even what we were doing, it was fairly one dimensional. You know, if if you run down, you know, look for the loop or look for the man coming in from the side, you know, that's just one tool in terms of how to deal with that blanket. Um, you need to add an awful lot more to it, and you know, Derry did that. Mm. And probably did it well at stages, and 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 we we just didn't, and it's just it's just frustrating. It's just frustrating. Mm. But at the end of the day, that you know, I just you've just got to back the lads. Yeah, look, I've probably given up on Donegal now at this stage after yesterday's game because having watched them the last three, four, five years, I thought they were absolutely primed to be Dublin's main. All Ireland contender. I thought they had all the ingredients throughout the team in terms of the goalkeeper. You know, attacking half backs, um, big rangy midfielders, wing forwards, obviously the star quality and Ryan McHugh, Michael Murphy, on Ban Gallagher, etc. Like they'd everything there and they've just com- continuously to disappoint and underachieve, in my yeah. opinion. And I think the management team has a lot to do with that. And, you know, I think they'll probably ship a fair bit of criticism and, and in my opinion, deservedly so, because every time you watch them, you just get a sense that there's another gear there if they showed a little bit more ambition and a little bit more adventure and actually utilised the strengths within the team, they could be very much an All-Ireland contender. But like, let's be let's be honest, when was the last time Donegal were even in an All-Ireland semi-final? 
Mm. You're going back to, to maybe 2014, you know, no, you know, having featured in Crow Park in the latter stages of the championship, better, uh, worse teams have got further than them over the last number of years, in, in my view. And I think um, yesterday was just the final straw because as the game developed and they got into that, you know, middle midpoint of the second half, all they had to do was just push on another five or 10 percent to get it over the line. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're bouncing into perhaps possibly a favourable All Ireland quarter finals once they're champions heading in the right direction. But yeah, I think uh, yesterday was just a massively disappointing uh, performance all around. Yeah, and I don't want to keep harping on about Donegal because we'll drive him into the red wine. But uh, <laughs> I think it's important to remember that Derry won this game and yeah. they won it mm-hmm. fair and square. They're the, they the better team on the day. How did they win it, Eamon? Was it a case of just sticking to what they've been doing what doing, and doing really well, trusting their own abilities and their own system and probably hoping that Donegal would try and mirror that because I think it actually played into Derry's hands. Obviously, they have a couple of warriors there, McKay, Glass, Rogers. They were all exceptional yesterday. Yeah, d- definitely. You know, th- th- That's probably the big thing. A lot of Derry's big men in terms of Glass, Rogers, and McKay done a brilliant job on, on Paddy. Uh, they stood up. Um. And, and, and Derry just, if, if you watch the game back, they, it was just two teams going at it the exact same way. And, yeah. and Derry were just more successful in terms of when they went to work it out and get the shot off, they were able to get it in. And that's where, you know, Derry done it well. They were smart. They were slick and they, on the offensive side and they just defended like dogs. And even if you look at Donegal's goal, there was an element of luck involved in that because... You know, Langan gets the contact and all it needed was, you know, Langan takes the ball off. I think it was Steve McMenamin. He, he rides a tackle, but it, he gets the shot off. It comes under pressure and, you know, or McFadden Ferry, you know, if the bail was a square ball or not, gets the rebound. And, you know, that, that's, that, that seemed to be the way Donegal mm. at, attacked. It was just constant, constant pressure, if you get me. Yeah. And, and the Rodgers... Uh, Murphy battle like I mean he nearly needed a player camp for that one alone you know because Rogers was he, was fast. he was and Michael Murphy had an influence on the game as well but you know it's, it's a debate that's gone on the last five six seven eight years you know around playing Michael Murphy and how to get the best out of him I think it's it's a no-brainer that he should be closer to goal I mean even that last snip of the play and Derry had to free um, with a minute to go in injury time and you know, they played a quick uh, short free to Rogers, and he run, ran 70 yards up the pitch with Michael Murphy going after him. Like, that's not a, an ideal situation for, for Michael Murphy having to go back there. Um, so I think that's something that the Donegal management team will have to try and address, I think, going into the, the next game. And Derry, looking forward, no, D- can Derry's system... Look, they've obviously done unbelievably well this year. They've an Ulster Championship, and they're going to enjoy, enjoy this yeah. maybe for the full week, I don't know. But can their system do it in Crow Park against a better team or will it be a case of right if they get a tough draw that's it for them this year and they'll have to build and grow the system like Mm. Donegal did your Donegal team Eamon but can't like we kept saying the teams know what's coming out with Derry but they played three very strong teams in Ulster Mm. and not one of them were able to stop them yeah um, now who's to say they mightn't play one of those teams again yeah, in, in an All-Ireland quarter final um, which would be very interesting I think certainly the asset test will be in Crow Park and how that system holds up I mean people talk about different pitch dimensions around the country and Crow Park isn't that much bigger um, dimension wise but it feels a lot bigger like you go into the yeah. stadium once you get on that pitch and you see mm-hmm. the 82,000 capacity around it, there's a lot of space there and the likes of Dublin Kerry other counties can really make hay with that space so that'll be the ultimate test to see if they can do that but I think a lot depends on the draw I think for Derry they're probably ahead of their development really mm-hmm. you know like getting to an Ulster final and winning those couple of games was serious serious progress for them this year um, so they're probably a year ahead in terms of that development but obviously they're going to take that Ulster title gladly yesterday and, and try and build on that from there Yeah and Eamon I don't know did you hear it uh, Cullen O'Rourke had a bit of a dig later on on Michael Murphy uh, for me like that an outsider a neutral a big fan of Michael Murphy he's, he was more or less saying that he can't be compared to one of the top players in the country over the last 10 years because he hasn't done it enough big days. From For yeah. me, it was a fella looking to grab headlines and get tongues wagging. But You're up- trying to press my buttons here, Darren. You just know <laughs> that I'm going to react to it. Um, 
wait till I, I, I say, I what else he said about you? <laughs> <laughs> I I think it's absolutely off the wall stuff, and for like I know Sean Kavanagh would have, would have challenged them on it, and um, but for you know a pundit in the inter county game to say that about Michael Murphy that he that he's not in the top table, like one of the greatest players. Of course, I'm going to be sensitive about because I'm from Donegal, but across the country, you know, Michael Murphy is in the, in the top four, top five players. And what he's what he's done, he's the most influential player that's that Donegal have and probably will, will have ever had in the game. And for Colm O'Rourke to go out, it's it's just there's nothing to it. It's saying stuff to get noticed, and it's just it's it's kind of personal wee jabe to say that because he's had a go at Murphy before, and it's just BS to be honest with you. Mm. It really really annoys me. And um, someone of the caliber like Michael Murphy, that's as good with his time, and he's just such a player mm. and it just really really get gets gets on gets under gets under my skin and like o'rourke was an unbelievable player myself now but for him to come out with with that kind of stuff it just it just baffles me yeah to totally be fair me. i wasn't gonna actually ask you but i, I just said i would since i was <laughs> i was pushing a few buttons because it was one of them statements that i feel a few people are coming out with statements like that now just because I think they know they'll get tongues wagging. And you know, while I was pressing your buttons, I said I might as well finish on a high and get you all riled up. But we're going to go down to Connacht because for me, Connacht is one of the few good championships. And uh, I got it wrong. Um, I thought Roscommon were going to come good. But Galway won their first, first title since 2018 and they were full value for it. Um, outstanding performance by Galway. Yeah. Harry. Absolutely, and, and particularly the full forward line. I mean, we all know about Shane Walsh, Damien Comer, and then Finnerty yesterday was outstanding, particularly in the first half, the points he got from play, um, which obviously is great for Pork Joyce and Galway because any team coming up against them, there'd be a huge amount of focus and, and energy on, on those uh, two particular lads, Comer and Walsh. So to have that extra scoring uh, prowess in there really just, I suppose, you know, spreads, spreads the load a little bit in that sense. But I think for, for both teams, you know, a lot of really good attack and play on, on, on display, but defensively, you know, you'd have to be worried about them as well. And in terms of going to Crow Park, because there was a lot of holes and the defensive systems weren't quite as as tight as you'd like them to be. But look, whereas Common and, and Galway, there hasn't been much between them over the last few years. And But it really was a big game for Galway, in my view. Bigger game than, than Ross Common, because Galway had actually lost, I think they've been in the last six or seven Connacht finals, last, but they lost the last three. So I think for the, the management team and those group of players, they couldn't lose a fort in a row it really would have knocked them back but um, they were full value for their victory a couple of quick things went in their favour certainly I think Enda Smith when he went through for that goal chance after 15-20 yeah. minutes he should have slipped that pass you know instead of going for goal himself that could have been a key uh, turning point in the game but the likes of Comer and particularly Shane Walsh Absolute joy to watch. I mean, the, the balance that he has, the two feet, um, he's probably the, the, the most naturally two-footed player in the country, and I'd, I'd include David Clifford in that as well. Um, and he's someone that will Galway will need to see sparkle now in, in the bigger games as we get to Crow Park for the, the business end of the championship. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked before, and I think the whole country probably talked about it, that Galway, to keep progressing, they need Conroy, they need Shane Walsh, and they need Comer on their game mm-hmm. all the time and they had that yesterday uh, 219 they kicked but obviously 216 they conceded it was a great game to watch in terms of scores everywhere I think Galway will have been surprised by how easily they were getting their shots off I, I always kind of thought to be a bit more biting Roscombe but they looked flat yesterday they, for me they actually made it quite easy for Galway at times it, it, it looked easy you know it looked easy in terms of when you look at it's probably taken a wee bit of credit from an unbelievable Shane Walsh goal. When you look yeah. at the way he was able to dance about there and and, and get that goal. And, and, you know, it's an interesting too because the mentality for maybe if you're in that game, in the Ulster game yesterday, you're hand-passing that ball over the bar. Yeah. Shane Walsh, throw a dummy, you know, got around the man. And as soon as he got the ball, all he was thinking about was goal. And, you know, that's what we talk about. You know, to to have that killer kill, killer instinct and to just really really go for it, um, and you know we would have flagged that for us common that something that's going they're going to get scores, but something that's going to let them down was their was their defense and probably Galway highlighted it for themselves yesterday that coming out of the league league final, their defense was an issue and it still seems to be an issue and it will be an issue, 
coming into the into the bigger days. Yeah, and Shane Walsh's goal was unbelievable. But then you throw in Patrick Kelly's goal. He's six foot four or five. It comes off the post. Just to have the reaction. <laughs> a little ballerina pirouette, yeah. a back step, and then a drop a kick drop into kick. the stanchion. <laughs> nice and handy, Connacht final in in Pure Stadium. Would you be doing that, Eamon? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing with that. I'm hand-passing that over the bar. There's no <laughs> drop kick or it's just hand-pass over the bar and get back, you know, because us big men, we're not supposed to be able to do that. Like. Uh, no, it was unbelievable. And we'll talk about it a bit later on, but I, I like the fact that you were on about it there. Um, the reaction, oh, hand-pass it over. You're on about Shane Walsh's. You're on about Patrick Kelly's. We'll talk about Kerry later. You need to have that killer instinct. You need to have that bravery to go for goal, we mentioned in the Ulster game and Donegal seemed to be lacking that bravery to go for something. Galway are going for it. They're going for shots. Like we said, I think Roscommon made it easier. They didn't seem to be a hand on a lot of the Galway shots, um, which was surprising for Roscommon. Yeah. They played Kerry the week before in a challenge game. Great for Kerry because they knew they wouldn't get a challenge. A bit strange for Roscommon to play a team at a quality of Kerry the week before a Connacht Championship and they looked flat. They did look fat, yeah, which, which uh, is surprising for them because they usually bring their A game in the Connacht Championship for all the matches. It doesn't yeah. matter who they're playing. You know, they've, they've beaten a lot of the sort of weaker teams in Connacht very easily and they've always put it up to Mayo and Galway in that sense. Um, but the thing with, with the hand pass, you know, I think a lot of people are talking these days about, you know, banning hand passes over the bar and stuff like that. I think it depends on the circumstance. Yeah. You know, because if you're two points down, two points ahead, and a couple of minutes to go, and going along the end line, the, the right option is probably to hand pass it over the bar to try and secure the win. But you know, you look at the Ulster final yesterday; there were so few goal chances. I mean, how many was there in the actual game? So if you do get a sniff of a chance, I think you do sometimes have to turn down the easy point yeah. and actually go for the juggler because you know. Goals are worth three points, but it can be worth a lot more than that. You know, it can really give teams a lift and it can obviously deflate the opposition as well. So um, I think it's something that Dublin have been particularly good at over the last few years is they know when to take the point and they know when they say, OK, let's go for the juggler and let's let's try and get a goal here. Um, and that's something that I suppose comes with experience and also from the training ground as well. Yeah, Eamon Galway obviously will be delighted after losing three Connacht finals in a row, they get over the line yesterday. The thing that impressed me most, even though they conceded 216, which the more I keep looking down at it, I'm like, oh, jeez, 216. You're There's a few late scores late they conceded, score. though, you know. But so. they did the same against Mayo, I think. That sweeper system worked well, and for a lot of the game, they did make the shooting opportunities a lot tougher for us common. And you'd imagine with a good a four weeks break now as well for them, that Park Joyce will be zoning in on that, because obviously we talked about it, you're going to Crow Park game, and... They're going to have to tighten up another bit, but I'm sure Pori Jason... Because they'll always score lets. enough. Oh, they'll always yeah. score. They have the quality, but they just need to keep focusing on that defence and get that right. But they seem to be good for 50-odd minutes, to be fair, and the game is kind of won. Amen. Yeah, and, and, and that's what it is for Galway. It's just getting finding that what's the best balance for them. What's what? How can we get the best out of Shane Walsh, Comer, you know, Conroy going forward? Um and how do we protect them at the back? Because there's an issue at the back, and how do we make sure that we're not vulnerable at the back? Because Clifford, you know, Con, these boys will just make a killing in that de- defense. Uh, should should go and make the carry or or Dublin uh, later in the year, and that's it just goes to the point where you made about Russ Common. Russ Common must have played half the country in a in a friendly because everywhere you talk to Russ Common are going well in this friendly. They played such and such. They played Donegal a few weeks ago too, and you know. What's the best? Is the best place to find find out about yourself in the friendlies, or is the best place to learn about yourself on the training ground? Stop the training, go back. That shape might work better, and you know that that's that's what Galway we need to do now is find that balance. What works better for them? Yeah, I'm actually I I would actually don't think you can find out anything in the challenge games or the training. To be honest, I'm one of them ones you you learn in the big games because I've seen it for so many times that fellas are unbelievable in training or unbelievable in challenge games. Different mentality, different bravery, different level of steely toughness in the championship games when it's yeah. really in the thick of it. So it's one of the ones, look, I can see why teams are playing ch- challenge games this year. Well, definitely I could see why a Dublin or Kerry would be playing challenge games. Ulster, they're getting enough tough games. I think maybe Ross Common felt that they might have been undercooked going into the they had a handy route into the Connacht final, maybe. But before we go down to Munster and Leinster, it's going to be a debate. We're talking about it all the time. The provincial championships again this year, they were a, a snore fest. 
Um, they're not going anywhere. But yeah. I think it's a matter of do we have to just move them to a different part of the calendar because there's no way of playing these Munster, Leinster and even look the Connacht Championship it would look it's more com- it's more competitive than Munster and Leinster but Roscommon will probably feel undercooked going into their qualifier game now because they've only had one proper game against Galway yeah. and they lost that so where are we going with it? I know this is a debate going on forever like yeah. but well I think for anyone who wants to get rid of the provincial championships entirely you know Derry's victory yesterday will yeah. will, will come back to haunt them in that sense but you know the Ulster Championship you've had four winners over the last four, four different winners over the last four years which is a good thing and we all know how, how much emphasis and importance they place on it up there and it's never going to be gone away but I think I think provincial championships should be downgraded in its importance, in my view, in, in the senior inter-county season. Um, I think someone referenced that maybe, you know, FA Cup style importance in that sense. But if you look at the league, the provincial championships and the All-Ireland series, you know, you'd have the All-Ireland series as number one, naturally. I'd have the league as number two and then the provincial championships as number three. So maybe there's a, a shift in the colour and that type of thing. Obviously, the Ulster Council, not a hope in hell, will they, um, you know, agree to that or allow to facilitate in that. So that's a real issue. But like, you know, the big thing for me at the moment is is the attendances um, for some of the other provinces have been way down compared to previous years and it's just not competitive and it's not enjoyable for a lot of players and also spectators so um, but when, when that will change or if it will change you know only only time will tell yeah Eamon any suggestions how are we going to fix this calendar I was just thinking Barry was at the last two Dublin games and they're so one sided now I think an opportunity for Leinster Council is to install a wee Playroom in Crow Park just to <laughs> occupy the kids while the game's on. And, you know. this, do we have to change this podcasting podcast to Emma McGee's parenting podcast? Aye, <laughs> uh, but like, th- there's no entertainment on the field, mm, and no. Lens- Leinster Council have they voted against Plan B last year. Uh, so I- I'm actually delighted these games are happening because I would have been shouting from the rooftops about the provincial championship is so lopsided. Um, and it goes back to a point. I remember reading Galvin's book in terms of Galvin could sleep, Paul Galvin could sleep, relax right up until the All Ireland series. Hmm. You know, there'd have been, he didn't really need to hit them top gears. Yeah. And I, I was just thinking that's so unfair for, for you know, the likes of Kerry. And now we see Dublin in the last, you know, 10, 10, 12 years that they can more <coughs> or less sleepwalk through the Leinster Championship. And let's have everybody starting off from the one spot here. That's that's what I would be saying in terms of the the All Ireland series. Yes, keep the provincials. Not saying get rid of them, but have everybody starting off. And you're still going to get mismatches. You mm-hmm. know, Dublin would have played Kildare. Kildare are a Division One outfit. They would have played Kildare and probably would have beat them. But give you know Tyrone that opportunity to do that to Kildare and have everybody out of the one bucket here. Yeah, I look. I don't think they're going anywhere. Like I, but it is a case of. Do you move into the start of the calendar? They're more of a pre-season. Get you prepped for the National League. The National League. And then at least you do, like you said, Barry, you're going from your third probably choice competition mm. onto your second. And you have enough games then built up in the league to be ready to go for championship. And just, I don't know, start in a new way. Maybe an open draw, an open format. They have to try something different because I think the argument was there a while ago. Well, I think most players are delighted with split season. There's some... Uh, pundits giving out about the split season I don't know why but they are saying that it's going to draw um, young kids going to play other sports but watching the games the weekend especially the Ulster or the Munster and the Lins final that's going to draw kids to other sports because they were boring Yeah absolutely I mean if you went by Saturday and you know all the sport that was on the telly uh, Champions League final European Cup final both games obviously went to the absolute death, death yeah. you know whereas the, the Munster final and Leinster final was pretty much done after 10 or 15 minutes so yeah. um, I think that in, in alone is a good snapshot to uh, to remember going forward Yeah so look we're, we're going to go from two competitive um, provincial finals down to to Leinster and Munster we'll start with Leinster because you're here beside me Barry you've been smiling since you came in <laughs> we have said that we thought the over celebrations in Newbridge in the league would come back to bite Kildare in the arse and not only did it bite him in the arse it kicked him full force up the hole 
Yeah, I, I remember that that game in Newbridge back in March quite well. And, and look, Kildare deserved their victory and, and they're entitled to celebrate. Absolutely no problem with their players and management doing it. But I, I just got a sense from the Dublin players that they were really annoyed, first of all, with the performance and the result, but maybe also the, the, the over-celebrating with the crowd and everything on the day itself. And I just really got a sense that those lads coming home on the bus from Newbridge thought to themselves, look, we're going to meet Kildare at some point in the championship, probably the Leinster final, end of May, Crow Park, sunny weather, we're going to be primed and we're, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to get them back basically. Yeah. And I just could sense that obviously, you know, from the opening four or five minutes when they got their first goal, they were saying, look, you know, you're not at our table yet. You're well down the pecking order. There's still a big gap here and we're going to show you here today. And, you know, Dublin were very slick, very uh, phenomenal movement. Look to be absolutely back at their best, but I'd have massive concerns about Kildare and wow. their defensive system and defensive duties. We'd flagged it before um, on the back of the Westmead game, the fact that Westmead strolled through in the first 30 seconds of that particular match and got a goal. But, you know, looking back, on, on the, I was at the game on Saturday, but and it was fairly obvious, but looking back on the highlights last night, last night, like you'd have to worry for Kildare going forward in terms of the defensive structure because, um, you know, the first goal that Kieran Kilkenny got after four minutes, um, he actually, I think it was Kevin Flynn, was uh, marking him, the, the yeah. number seven for Kildare. You know, when the ball was developing, the play was developing in front of the Cusick stand, Flynn had 15 yards on, on Kieran Kilkenny in terms of being goal side on Hill 16. Kieran then decides to make this hard 50 yard burst. By the time Khan got the ball, Kyle Cannell got the ball and slipped inside, passed it to Kieran. You know, Kieran was 15 yards ahead of Kevin Flynn. So how he thought, you know, I can ball watch here and not worry about Kieran Kilkenny is beyond me. I mean, yeah. even going back to my time playing half as a half back in, in these bigger games against these bigger players, whether you're up against Brian McGuigan or Declan O'Sullivan or Galvin, whoever, the first 10, 15 minutes as a half back, you got to be thinking, geez, I'm going to just lock down and not keep my eyes off my opponent. I mean, Kieran McKenney's been one of the best players in the country for the last 10 years, still easily one of the top five players in the country now. How you <laughs> someone could yeah. actually ignore him for that little passage of play and let him saunter through for a goal is beyond me. So, you know, they have real issues going forward in terms of the, that, that defensive setup. And Eamon? That, that, that was something that I, that I seen too, Barry. And, you know, I was, I was sitting watching when a mate of mine, Christy Toy, and we both, we both seen it. Yeah. That, you know, the defensive we would call defensive intensity was just abysmal yeah. and again again that, defensive that's instincts game. just wasn't there yes yeah. yeah and to do that with a forward line you know con you know kieran kilkenny and, and these lads was just unforgivable and you'd like to think there's a bit of learning there but it was so far off it and they've such a journey you know there was a lot of talk about kildare coming into this uh, provincial final that they, they probably weren't going to win but they would have put it up to dublin but they were so far off, you you just wonder like they they have a good bit to learn here. Is that just the way the modern day halfbacks are now, though? Especially the wing backs, are they just good at going forward? The majority of them, and they chip in with a couple of points every game, and it masks over how poor they are defensively. And it, poor old Flynn's going to get caught again here. He got caught the third goal as well. Was it Barry? Yeah, yeah, the third goal, um, Comer Costello's one again. I, I think Bugler come across with the ball, and a Kildare defender actually came into contact and was actually tackling him. And I think Flynn was meant to be marking Costello and took two steps forward to tackle Bugler, which was absolutely no need. And it made up Bugler's mind for him to just hand pass the ball over his head. And again, Costello with a brilliant finish. And Dublin were excellent in that regard, but geez, Kildare made life so much easier for them. And like for me, I absolutely would prefer to have six solid backs. You know, and yes, yeah. if they can add things going forward, that's fine. And there's a bit of balance there. You would have even seen it like Jack McCaffrey, one of the greatest attacking wing backs ever. Jack, you know, did get better with his defensive duties as he got older. But, you know, if you don't have that compact uh, defensive mindset and instincts, yeah. you're going to come a cropper against the bigger teams. And, you know, to, to ignore that after four or five minutes was just, you know, crazy for me. And, and I think that's down to, you know, it's not the fact that there's no, the defensive skills and, and players nowadays, it's, they're very good. They're physically conditioned better than, you know, we ever were, but there's a nearly collective defending and sometimes you, it's easier to pass the book on, you know, but there still has to be individual responsibility and maybe that's what was lacking, you know, Asher, listen, I'm the, 
the Dublin players run, running back here, someone else will pick it. And it, do, it means, you know, for me looking onto that there, you know, it's a sprint. Even if you're gassed, you're, you're sprinting as hard as you can to get back, you know, and, you know, to stop that score. And the score, if they get the score, it's got to come at a price now. And it just seemed to be the mentality was, sure, listen, someone else, someone else will get the, get the contact or get the turnover. Eamon, where would you go if you were in that Kildare dressing room or part of management? Where where'd you go from here? Because look, we know the defence needs an awful lot of work, but and we know we've talked about the forwards on previous shows. If good forwards, Jimmy Highland kicked a great score in the first half after thirty two minutes, but I, I think it might have been one of his first touches of ball, maybe his first. Like they badly need to go back to the drawing board because whatever progress they made or however much praise they were getting over the last couple of months. That's gone now, like, because what they did for the first 25 minutes was scandalous. That, that's the danger. That, that's, that's another victim of the, the Leinster football provincial mess that it is, you know, that whatever progress has been wiped out by Dublin, like, they, they I nearly think it's a psychological thing seeped yeah. into them that they just lie down to Dublin. Um, and where, where do they go? It's in such a hammer and you, you don't see anywhere for them to go this season you know what what talking or what are they going to do in the training field and the next you know few nights that are going to dramatically bar you know going everybody behind the ball and making them really hard to break down and you know i don't think that would suit the kildare team and and, and what they're about um but it's it's hard to see them you know p- p- pick it up unless they get a really kind draw um and that's hard to see in, in this uh, backdoor system the way it is now yeah then all they can do is just try and get lads to stay positive and think big picture here and think we're 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 about building and you know try and sell it that we knew this was coming or something like that there but, yeah you know the, players can smell the only uh, positive i have is that they chipped in with a couple of scores in the second half they didn't totally crumble because to be fair they should have blown it up at half time and said, look, go on away off there and watch the rugby for yourself because <laughs> this is awful. But look, we won't harp on about Kildare. I want to talk about Dublin. I want to build up the dubs. <laughs> <laughs> but they have been, and you can talk about the standard of the team they've played in their previous games, but Kildare are normally a good team and they should have been better than that. But Dublin are so ruthless. Their skills are back on the money and right, they won that game at their ease. But they slipped from second gear to fifth gear and different moments in that game, especially for the goals. Mm. And that's the difference, I think, at the moment in Dublin and Kerry. Yeah. They're just, ru- like, they don't care. It was they- funny because I was at the Mead game and there was probably a few half goal chances there for them, but they were very content and just chipping the ball over the bar from 20, 25 yards out. And they racked up a really high number of scores there. Very uh, economical and, and very slick with their shooting. And then, yes, obviously on, on Saturday, I don't know if they had an internal conversation or what beforehand where they said we're going to go for goals here and like the finishes were top class like they really were the, we, we predicted the fi- this that they'd do yeah. it early yeah. and it would be a case that Kildare would automatically go oh no not this again mm. <laughs> but all five goals were really good finishes I mean Cormac Oslo's first goal with, with the left foot when it came off the post I mean you won't see a better finish than that John Small as well getting forward John for Smalls his first a goal brilliant finish brilliant and he, finish, he yeah. turned around as if he does it every week I know <laughs> <laughs> yeah not a bother on him so look Dublin were absolutely at the, at the pitch of it on Saturday they seem to be timing their run really well obviously they've got it over the, the sort of the hangover and the baggage of, of the National League campaign for them. The training camp, I think, over in Portugal must have been brought a nice bit of freshness to them. But obviously, Conor Callahan getting back as well and getting fit. I mean, he's been just absolutely incredible over the three games and is pretty much unmarkable. And, you know, not only does he score and win frees, but the way he brings other players into the game, you know, winning that ball out in front of the D. And I think I think Kildare, you know, only brought back a sweeper in front of the D after the fourth goal or something like that, you know. But sure game you know the, the horse had bolted at that stage yeah. um, but everything going well for Dublin at the moment and also the new guys have come in the likes of Gannon the likes of Lehiff have done Gannon really well lovely really well and that means that the likes of Scully Paddy Small Johnny Cooper are on the bench so Desi has you know really experienced mature players to bring in for the last 10 to 20 minutes which is exactly what the he'll want um, maybe not for the quarter final but certainly for a potential Dublin Kerry semi final. <laughs> how, how important is James McCarthy to that, Barry? In terms of, you know, he obviously came in late enough on the league and 
there just seemed to be a bit more of a focus about and you know con's the con's the obvious one there now but would would james be his captain and yeah would, would... absolutely um i mean james has been an absolute phenomenal footballer for dublin but he is he does have those leadership traits within the dressing room and on the pitch itself and i think dublin obviously were struggling during the league and the first game he properly came back for was the donegal <laughs> league game and you know he, he slotted in straight away having had no matches under his belt and dublin collectively put in a much better performance with him on the pitch so you know he's the type of guy you'd go to war with and, and in the trenches mm-hmm. with and you know how Having one of your best players as one of your, you know, your hardest working players is only a good thing because he will not ask of any player to do something that yeah. he wouldn't do himself. You know, he's just he's business like, no nonsense, gets on with it, and he's just you know an all round you know brilliant guy to have there. Yeah, look, he's no matter what happens this year or next year, he's going to go down one of the best ever. Yeah, do you know that's just simply that, like you said, from the outside, he does strike you a fella. There's no. There's no huff and puff. There's no glamour. It's just, I'm yeah. there. I'll do my job better than most mm. and I'll just get on with it. But we won't stick too long on it because it was a great game down in Munster as well and I want to give it a good bit of time. But yeah, yeah, 128 <laughs> to 8 points. Um, before we start in Kerry, look, from a Kerry point of view, I was actually delighted to see Limerick progressing, but they're a million miles off this. And I, I don't think there'll be anything negative Look, obviously they'd be embarrassed, whatever coming up. Mm. But they've done exceptionally well to get to this point. And right, I don't think this is going to set them back. It's obviously not going to bring them on. But I think for Limerick going forward, it's just a matter of just keep showing the right. Top Billy Lee spoke well after the yeah. game as well, like how proud he was of the boys. And it's just about kicking on because look, we knew look this is the problem with the provincials, mm. and it's definitely a problem in uh, Kerry since Cork have disappeared, fallen away, yeah. yeah. So And I look for Limerick, this was a free game really, you know, because they'd done all the hard work, they'd made huge progress in this year between the National League and also in the Munster Championship itself. So really it was a bonus match for them playing Kerry in Killarney. They weren't going to get a huge amount out of it, but I think maybe for them having a little eye on the following game was something that was important as well. And just not saying getting the game, Kerry game over and done with, there was probably elements of the game that they wanted to try and work on and, and see if they could um, curtail Kerry or, or maybe different things around kickouts and stuff like that. But look, Limerick have been very much uh, one of this, this year's success stories, yeah. and I don't think that will be lost on Saturday's performance or result. And I think for them, look, it's you know they're still in the mix. They're in the last twelve of the All Ireland series, heading into Division Two for next year. So they've still a lot to be positive about. And you know, I think when they go back training tonight or tomorrow, they'll still have a, a very you know good spirit amongst the group yeah. heading into that, compared to the, maybe the likes of Kildare on, on the back of their performance. It's actually know? just a pity that they aren't in the Talitian Cup because I think that would have probably benefited their um, progression a bit more. But Eamon, watching on, what would you make of Kerry? I know it's hard to judge him on it, but for me, what I thought they were sloppy, especially in the first half. I, I, l- listen, as you say, there's, there's not a lot you can take from it. They just didn't have to come out, uh, come into them top gears that, that you know you'll need in the, in the, in the big days ahead now. Um, and probably because they were sloppy, because they just need, didn't need to do they, like the game. The game let themselves be sloppy, and you know, for them, it's not great preparation. And it just goes back to that point in terms of what do they do now? Like for for me, looking on from the outside for Kerry and where they're at now, they should be building, or hopefully that you they would have built towards what Dublin done on on the you know when they were at their peak in terms of A versus Bs. That's what Kerry should be doing and yeah. getting the whole panel on that wavelength and, you know, creating that environment and training where, you know, because we heard so much and Barry might talk about it a bit more about the A versus B. Yeah, I don't know, was that deliberate by Dublin? But the, they used to say that, you know, the best challenge they got, uh, it wasn't in Leinster. It was, you know, them, that the, the B team putting it, putting it up to the A team. And maybe that's what Kerry, Kerry should be focusing on or. Yeah. Would, would uh, should uh, have focused on? Uh, absolutely. I mean, they, they probably would have penciled in, you know, the All Ireland quarter final date and sort of worked back from there. And we were, you know, pretty confident they'd get through Munster relatively unscathed. And the same with Dublin. I mean, the Dublin A versus B games 
allegedly we, we had them with Pat Gilroy then with Jim Gavin as well I mean it was 50-50 as to who was going to win an A versus B training yeah. game in Dublin uh, training sessions it was that competitive lads were arriving to train and an hour an hour and a half before training separate dressing rooms ready to go to war and battle knowing that you're either competing for the first 15 or to come on as a sub or get into 26 because you know what's the alternative you can't rely on Leinster opposition or Munster opposition to get you ready for a knockout game in Crow Park at the business end of the season so you have to take control of it and say yeah. right we're going to really zone in on this particular these particular games whether it's once a week or twice a week that they're having them and put a real emphasis on them so I think Kerry and, and Jack O'Connor I'd be amazed if that approach hasn't been taken over the last few weeks I know it will be and it, like that was always the approach just going back over the last 10 yeah. years and we were fortunate enough we had a strong panel and it, they are the games that are important the AVBs they, they're the only thing that actually prime you up for the pace of championship games and like that the competition once you know they're a place up for grads whether it's in the starting 15 or coming off the bench or even getting into the first mm. 26 it's them kind of games that are going to keep you keep you sharp, sharp like yeah. that Killian Splane got a, got the nod the weekend maybe wouldn't have got it if Clifford was fit he came come away with one three um talked about it earlier about Dublin getting goals Kerry aren't getting goals the one goal he got to be honest I didn't know where the Limerick defender went but he wasn't there and it was a good finish it was ruthless he didn't have to go for goal could have put it over but Sean O'Shea punched over two I think um, Tom Sullivan came over punched one yeah, for me I know you'd say look the game was over the game was won but you get used to scoring goals mm. you get used to being in that position and being ruthless no matter what the score is and mm. I'm all for you're coming in from an angle at pace that it's finna come across you flick it over the bar mm. I'm all for that but when there's a goal on yeah go for it I, I and I think for, for some of the Kerry players on, on Saturday as well you know they could have turned down the point and slipped it across the goal for a handy goal yeah. for a teammate and that's something that Dublin are absolutely brilliant at and have been for years but I think your, your point is well made in that Kerry They've been knocked out in the championship the last three, four years and essentially been out gold in those mm. games. You know, you look at Tyrone last year getting the, the three goals against them, Cork the previous year, Dublin in, in 2019 and so on. So I think that killer instinct has to come back into them. Now, it absolutely is in them, you know, <laughs> like, you know, themselves in Dublin, they could go out tomorrow and, 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 and rack up a number of goals against lesser opposition. So I think it's just a bit more of a mindset maybe yeah. going into the game itself and, so, and you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't get too many goals now in the quarter final, depending on who they're playing. I think it's something that might be spoken in, in the dressing room and on the pe- training pitch over the next week or two. Yeah. And before we move on to the Talton Cup, just want to give a nod to Josh Ryan, who kicked an absolutely worldly of a point up by the sideline with a pair of Mikasa gloves on. <laughs> <laughs> Why he needed the gloves, I don't know, but they look great. I don't think they were the old cottony ones, you know, that, get, yeah. that when they get wet, they weigh about a tonne. No, I didn't have any of them now back in the day. A few of the lads, I think, did in the dressing room, but tended to stay away from I, those. I was, a big, I was a big man for them. I was about to say, you're definitely a Macassa man. <laughs> <laughs> Just sitting in, sitting in full back, uh, catching everything with the Macassas. <laughs> they were a dream of gloves, but your man had them on the weekend. I don't think they were the same material anymore, but I don't know why he was wearing gloves. Yeah, it's strange now. It's not January, February time, or you know, no. stick of some cup weather, or that yeah. type of thing, yeah. Anyway, look, each to their own, but... It didn't affect him too much, but he put in a decent performance. But at least over the weekend, the Talton Cup threw up a couple of um, good good games, good performances. Kevin obviously got off to a, a good start, and I was delighted. I know it was seven or eight points in the end, or, um, but Down put up a bit of a shift. Um, I think it was 24 points to 112. But there was a couple of great games, Sligo and uh, London. Yeah. And obviously Leitrim had a big win there with Andy Moore. And so hopefully now... Um, Going into this round, there's going to be some more good games. And obviously, a lot of people are saying they're more like provincial ties, but their provincial ties are teams of equal standard. So they will yeah. be exciting. It's just a pity a few of them aren't. They, they aren't will, yeah. Them. I mean, definitely worth a, a mention is Raymond Gallagher's performance there at, at the weekend for Cavan. Oh, yeah. You know, he, he, he saved the first penalty, which was retaken, which was, seemed quite harsh, and then and saved it again. But his, his strike and his kicking was absolutely phenomenal. You know, the seven out of seven kicks that he had 
probably ranged between 40 and 60 yards, different distances, different angles um, in, in Breffney Park at the weekend and absolutely you know, a phenomenal performance from him. He's obviously the, the Calvin captain and all-star from a couple of years yeah. ago, but you know it just goes to show where, where the goalkeeping has gone over the last few years. But yeah, I think the Talton... It was the co- second best goalkeeping performance over the weekend. We, I know he's our big uh, Man United man, so <laughs> Cor- Cortot. <laughs> Porto was your uh, favourite performance of the weekend now. yeah and I, I didn't see a comment from him now no I didn't he, he gave sticking into you as he well did, about yeah. that he's not getting respect and I suppose Leitrim had a big win and uh, Andy Moran said it after the kind of championship he was going to focus in on it um, a good win over uh, Antrim and Andy McGinley stepped down after but you could see the celebrations of Carlo Carlo had a mighty win all together against mm. Tipperary and I seen a great picture on Twitter this morning of when the Carlo lads down his knees celebrating. And do you know that's what yeah. you want to see. And the incentive is there now, obviously the draw was made this morning. I mean, all of them are just one game away from Crow Park, you know, so which is a big incentive for players that, that we don't get to see enough. You know, the semi finals are gonna be on live T V, so they're now at a quarter final stage, which has come about quite quickly. Um but I think it's been great to see it. the majority of teams have really embraced it and you know, you mentioned about Leecham and Carlo and even you know, Tony McEntee came out and said, you know, six, seven weeks ago when they lost their provincial game, we're gonna focus on on the uh, Talton Cup because you know there's no alternative. We're going. We have the players. We've a group of guys here that are ambitious. We want to develop them. We want to evolve. Um, and you know it, it's great to see them all embrace that. And I think it's set up nicely for for a couple of weeks time when those matches are on. Yeah, and we had uh, Eamon, we had Mickey Quinn on last week, and obviously mm. they were unlucky. They got beaten by one score by goal against Fermanagh. And I think over the last number of. Um, meeting between the two counties there's only been a score in it um, but he spoke really well about the Telton Cup and unfortunately they're out now but like listening to someone like him who's been around the block a long time played professional over in the AFL and different ideas he had I, I have no doubt to be honest after talking to a few lads now who were involved in it that it's going to be a big success so um, I'm looking forward to the games now this weekend probably tune into a few of them on GA Go and then the semi-finals they'll be on TV so um, a bit of excitement st- to come every weekend yeah, and, and that, that was the main group that you needed to get over the line because if you get 15, 20 players that really care about the competition, you know, doesn't doesn't matter what kind of market and, you know, how much supporters go to it, it's the players and the group that need to, to buy into it and then you need the county board to back them. And it seems to be, and I love that picture, you know, I, I know the one you're on about, Darren, the Cardo player, I just so passionate, you know, he was so delighted that he won and and that's going forward now that's the template for for the lads you know there, there's an opportunity here another game for your county just to, another opportunity to test yourself against the best around the country and you know I'm, I'm coming off the weekend yes there was you know what i'd love to sit down you know if you get an opportunity for you to sit down at end of mcginley mm. and talk to him about the challenges with the antrim job because antrim seemed to be that county that has loads of potential but they're just not, you know, getting forward. And what step in Antrim from from taking that's like like what seemed to be Limerick are doing. So you know that, that that's an opportunity now if you get in this number, Darren, just to see what the what the crack is there. Yeah, and Antrim they always reminded me a little bit of Derry in that sense, you know, because they had a brilliant club team there with mm. St Gall. So there's yeah. certainly a lot of good players in the county, but you know they just never have have kicked on. But I think for a lot of these counties now that are in that Talton Cup quarterfinals, they're all winnable games for the eight teams. Yeah, and you know the the car to get into a semi final. It's not as though you're going to play Dublin or Kerry in Crow Park in the semi final. You're going to be playing against a team that you know at yeah. your level that you can compete with and, and get a win and, and get to the final. And that's that's what it essentially is all about. But that's the thing; they're all in with a realistic chance of yeah. getting to Crow Park and actually winning silverware. Yeah, and that's to be all and end all. I I don't care what names on the cup. If you're playing in Crow Park and you have a big following of your home support and you get to it's going to be a memorable experience. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. going to be amazing. Obviously, New York are in the comp- are in now after getting a bye for the first two rounds, so <coughs> they're down to Tullamore. So it'll be interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to it, to be fair, and like hopefully get a few more lads on the show in the next few weeks um, talking about the Talitian Cup. Um, and it was actually Dara Foley celebrating for Carlo. Couldn't think of the name. Um, but it was. It was a brilliant picture. And there are the moments, because Carlo, I suppose, in that game, I think 11 points they'd last in the league to Tipperary and they turned around Tipperary another team who've disappointed over the last number of years another 
county that need to kind of get that focus back. I know they lost a lot of players since they won the Munster Championship, so I was hoping they'd get a run in this and they'd be to kick it on. Of course, I'm thinking of a Munster Championship kind of hat and the more competition down there, the better for everyone. But um, no, look, it was good and more excitement, more exciting games to come. And obviously down in Munster, we had the Kerry Cork in the, in the football. Unfortunately for Kerry, just a step too far, Cork got the better of him. But it was great for me personally to see the ladies game on before the men's game. The only disappointment was there wasn't much of a crowd in it. But I was chatting to Kerry's eye actually last night and um, you have to start somewhere and it should be a fixture in the calendar that before every Munster Championship game now with the way the calendar is that the ladies game should be on before it and get as many people in as possible because like I have a daughter at home now and she's a bit young for going at the moment but hopefully in the next couple of years I'll be able to be bringing her and above in Leinster um, Dublin Barry eventually got over yeah. the line against Mead because uh, Mead seemed to have their number for the last number of meetings. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I brought the kids into the All Ireland final, ladies final last year, which which was a really great occasion and great day. That despite um, Dublin's result and an our defeat to Mead, and and Mead actually beat them there in the league um, a few weeks ago yeah. as well. So it was a big game for Dublin to try and get back on track. But again, it was a great double header on Saturday. Same as yourself, Darren. I have a seven year old daughter at home who's mad into GEA and, and down on Bridges every weekend. Um, and it was great to be able to bring her to, to the game and, and, and see them. And we have a couple of club members on the Dublin uh, ladies panel as well. So, you know, it's all about trying to increase the profile and the awareness of the games and, and obviously, you know, bringing daughters or sisters, nieces, whoever that might be to it, it's, it's only going to bode well going forward. Yeah, and Sinead Goldrick was the player of the match and uh, might have been a sweet one for her seeing as uh, the media manager was giving her a bit of stick over the last... Uh, yeah, it was strange comments to, yeah. to come from him. I, I thought it was a bit disrespectful, to be honest. I think it was kind of heat at a moment thing because she's been one of the top players in the country for the last 10 years nearly and yeah. she's been one of the faces of ladies Gaelic football helped mm. grow the game. Like So it was a strange one, to be fair. Um, but I think he was more thick about... The, the AFL. Yeah, yeah, and I think he was just trying to use that as an example or whatever. But look, she got her own back the weekend and uh, I'm sure it was a sweet one for Dublin because, like we said, Mead had their number the last number of years. So, But before we go, Eamon, I'm going to go back to pressing your buttons before we finish up. Good man. <laughs> <laughs> Can Donegal put this behind them and kick on? Can they prove... Well, I don't know, are they proving us right or proving us wrong at this stage because I'm so confused by them. Can they kick on? Can they put that game behind them? Can they start focusing more on themselves and become a contender this year? Or is it game over, ball burst, restart next year? Um, It's it's going to be very hard. You know, should Derry have lost that game yesterday, it'd been easier for them to bounce back and say, listen, we're on a crest of a wave here and you'll carry a bit of that momentum into the qualifiers. But with Donegal and the way the Cavan result ended in 2020, I think it was. Yeah. It was really disappointing to lose another provincial title. And it's just hard to see them, you know, get get up for it again now. But I'm kind of, I know the lads, I know the caliber of them, and I know that, you know, that's the challenge they'll set, that set themselves, that they have to, you know, by all accounts, you know, could be Declan Boners last year. Rochford is there also, you know, can't see him doing another year. So, you know, to go out and maybe change the whole, just to have a go and not 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 change the whole philosophy, but you know, alter it and make we 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 tweaks it in terms of what 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 way we're going to attack here. The draw will be interesting, you know, yeah. to see who comes through because obviously there's no there's no easy game as such to feel your way back into the championship oh. where you might be playing a Division 4 team and yeah. you're going to be straight into it. Yeah, there's a couple of Division 2 teams there that would be more favourable for Donegal, but, you know, they could end up drawing uh, the, the winners of Tyrone or Tyrone, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well Tyrone that... will be delighted just to put uh, Donegal out against. But on the yeah. other foot, you know, that's the that's the game that we yeah. get Donegal up for. Get, you know, the, get their juices get going. The back in the road again. Yeah, yeah. Look, hopefully now we are getting to the business end of it, so there's going to be loads more excitement. But unfortunately, that's all we have time for in today's show. Big thanks to my two guests, Aim McGee and Barry Cal, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>